Thank you for joining the National Headache Foundation's Cluster Headache webinar. Today we have Don. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, the title of this is Cluster Headache, and uh, Cluster is kind of a unique headache disorder. Uh, when we look at, you know, most patients that come into a primary headache center. In fact, the, uh, in the old days, they used to call it the suicide headache because it really um, almost made people um, you know, want to bang their head against the walls during the, the short time that they have these attacks. Um, it's predominant in men, which is also in contrast to uh, migraine, which is predominantly a female disease. Um, usually with, migra with migraine, it's a female to male ratio of 3 to 1. In cluster, you have an American, it's about 3 to 1 male to female. So it's still you know, heavily a predominant male disorder in contrast to migraine. Um, the mean age at onset is 27 to 31 years old, which is about 10 years later than that of migraine. And when we think of migraine, uh, we look at uh, younger women, for instance, who first start going through their periods in their early teens. That's a very common time to see it. You can even see it in kids as young as six or seven. With cluster, it tends to be more towards um, late high school to the 20s, somewhere in that range with the mean age and the late 20s. And, you know, migraine encompasses 12% of the population. So when you look at, you know, there's, we call it the 36 million campaign, which you guys may be familiar with. We, we say there's 36 million people in the United States, which is 12% of 300 million that suffer from migraine. Well, 0.1% of 300 million is a very tiny number, but it's still a significant enough disorder. And in a headache center, we vicious. Um, yeah, the ten, you know, the old headache back in the 50s and 60s would show men and women, whereas migraine tends to uh, be similar to the general population, you know, where it's about 20% or less that actually smoke. When you look at cluster, it's more about 97 to 98% that smoke, much, much higher percentage, and uh, less consistent is heavy alcohol use. Uh, and one of the things avoid it completely because that tends to be a trigger for the headache. Um, there's no evidence of increased psychopathology associated with cluster headache patients, meaning that um, the incidence of things like depression, anxiety, um, and other cluster headache patients than they are in the general population. So most of these patients are very high functioning. Uh, they're very, you know, they, they live normal lives and everything. This kind of hits them in their late uh, 20s, early 30s. Um, some of these patients may have family history, but this is less consistent than in migraine. We know that there is a genetic component to migraine, and some of the genes have been isolated in recent years, but there's not really been a true um, gene isolated for cluster headache. Cluster headache characteristics. Um, when we talk about cluster, we look at um, the headaches usually occurring every day, sometimes several times a day, and patients have described you know, as many as five or six or more than that in some cases, episodes of these. Um, the headache attacks can often occur at the same time each day with many of them occurring at night, usually one to two hours after falling asleep. So one of the things that patients describe when they're in the middle of a cycle is that they tend to have almost a phobia of going to sleep because they know that when they're in the middle of a cycle, there tends to be a likelihood of a lot of a deep sleep and uh, are awakened due to an attack. A single attack may last from 15 minutes to three hours. This is also in contrast to migraine, which we know is anywhere from three hours to 72 hours, a much longer duration of action. So we know that migraine, while it's longer, it tends not to be as severe an intensity as these short bursts of cluster headaches. Um, after the attacks, most patients are pain-free, which is also in contrast to migraine. Because most migraine patients, after they're done with their headache, a lot of times they'll have residual pain even after it's gone. But mostly with cluster, when you're out of an attack, you're most likely going to be pain-free and occurring over time as they may have four or five of these attacks in a day. Um, next slide, please. Um, other percent of the time is bilateral or two-sided, so both left and right. Cluster is very unique in that you never have two-sided headaches with cluster. So patients will describe the location immediately around their eye and in their eye and in the orbits on the affected side. So they have, they have a right side of the headache, it never switches to the left side. It's always a right side of behind the eye and around the eye area. And the pain is described as tearing or boring, and with the analogy of a hot poker in the eye, that's also kind of unique. So it's not a throbbing pain. It's kind of a searing or boring type pain, and uh, it feels like a hot poker. It's a very unique description that people describe, but that which you don't get with just about any other type of sensitivity. Sensitivities could also occur similar to migraines. So that also kind of, so a lot of people um, walk in, it's hard to 
unless you do a really detailed history on the patient, they may come in saying I have this really severe headache, you know, it's a 10 out of 10 on the pain scale, and I get nausea, light sensitivity, sound sensitivity, similar to migraines. So there's other features that we have to look at with cluster that we're going to talk about that are kind of unique about this headache that make it different than migraine. Um, and we'll go over in a couple more slides in here, but uh, as far as the clinical manifestations, the attacks occur at least once. Uh, so, uh, if you can do the next slide, please. Uh, so when we look at the attacks, they occur at least once every 24 hours for 6 to 12 weeks at a time. So it's kind of, you know, we talk about the clustering of the headache from spring or from summer to fall. So we do see a fair amount of this in September and October as we head out of summer into the fall. So this is kind of the peak time for that. Sometimes the patients are very restless and sometimes even feel violent because of the pain. Instead of migraine, where patients, in migraine patients like to lay, look at cluster, the patients prefer to pace or sit and rock back and forth. You know, they don't want to be laying down. They actually, it, it, sometimes the patients will tell you they prefer to pace and walk back and forth through the hallways. And it's a very distinctive feature that they, they describe on this to sleep. I mean, I'm, you know, they were worried about getting a, uh, an attack one to two hours after the headache, uh, after they actually go to sleep, which is phobia of going to sleep. So we always look at regulating the sleep because that does play a factor in this headache. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so this headache compared to migraine and other headache disorders, I live on the same side of the headache. Um, it's very unique. And when you look at that, you'll never forget it when you see on a patient. Where you see there, when they're in the middle of the headache cycle and they have the headache striking them, you'll see that eyelid going down. So if the headache hits them on the right eye, their right eye will start drooping down. It's very, very unique. And they get redness in that eye on the affected side. And they also get tearing on the, of the eye on the affected side, which is due to temporary blockage of the nasal lacrimal duct. So you actually will see a very unique descript patient, which you very rarely see, if ever, in other. That's not very common in uh, cluster headache patients. If you can go to the next slide, please. Um, when we have a fairly good idea, we can localize the physiology, the timing, and the cyclical nature. The hypothalamus regulates a lot of the core body processes, and when it's off, your circadian rhythm is off too. And so we know that there's somewhat of a cyclical nature. It's a transient thing where the headache only lasts for several weeks at a time rather than years and years. Um, and when we think about, in contrast to migraine, it's usually not associated with dietary, hormonal, or stress triggers. So we know that in, in uh, women with migraine, for when they're in their early teens, and then again in their perimenopausal years, in their 40s or 50s, when their body's preparing for menopause, well, this does not occur with cluster. We don't have a clear association with hormonal triggers. And stress doesn't really, although stress can technically trigger any type of headache, but it's not clearly associated with cluster strike. Um, after the cluster cycle begins, alcohol can often trigger a cluster headache attack. So some of the heavier drinkers that have cluster. Um, other possible triggers include the use of nitroglycerin. You know, you're in the ambulance, you're in the emergency room, and they're doing the workup for chest pain. They normally will give nitroglycerin under the tongue. Well, just like it can trigger a migraine attack, it can also trigger a severe cluster headache episode as well. And the derivatives of nitroglycerin also have that problem. Now, if we can go on to the next slide, please. Diagnostic studies in cluster headache. The patient will give you the answer right there, and you'll see You'll absolutely be able to know when they tell you the timing of their headaches, what their symptoms are with it, the way that they prefer to be pacing rather than laying down. They don't need to be in a dark room. You know, all those things are uh, things that need to wake people up to understand. That's what this is definitely not going to be a migraine. And what we do, as far as diagnostic studies go, um, really we just use a CT or MRI of the brain to confirm a primary headache versus a secondary headache disorder. And, what we want to do is, you know, obviously we're looking for things like aneurysms, strokes, bleeds, those kinds of things, you know, and um, those are the more serious secondary headaches. Secondary headache disorders are headaches that are caused by other, those are the real serious things, so aneurysms, tumors, stroke, et cetera. And that's really the main thing you need to do, so it's a very easy diagnosis to make. You do a history that should be normal to show that there's nothing else wrong in the brain, and that's pretty much it. You don't need to do a spinal tap, you don't need to do... Uh, more detail screen exam alone. Um, next slide, please. Um, the question on here is when is cluster headache, uh, cluster headache pain? Pretty much headache free the rest of the year. Um, but there's a rare form of chronic cluster headache, which we sometimes see in more, uh, you know, the big city headache centers and stuff. Those types of patients are ones that have attacks that occur for more than a year or have remission that lasts less than 14 days. These patients are in and out of cycles nonstop.
throughout the year. And some of them have no break at all, literally not one day, 0.1% of 0.1%. So you're getting a very tiny amount of, pa of patients in the general population that have chronic. And those are the real difficult ones to treat. So those are the ones that have, uh, I'm sorry, it's 10% of 0.1% that have actual chronic cluster headache versus episodic. So when you see most patients, when you do the history, one of the things we look for, too, is deciding how long these episodes last for. Is there a remission period? Is there a seasonal component to it? Um, there's a rare form of the disease that starts as what we call primary chronic cluster headache, which is someone who gets a cluster headache day number one and never breaks out of it. Most patients with chronic disease um, evolves from the episodic form, meaning that for you know, 10 years or 15 years, they keep having once a year these breakthroughs for 6 to 12 weeks. They'll go through a remission for a year, then the next year will come back, and then all of a sudden, you know, after 10 or 15 years, they'll evolve in this, from episodic to chronic. But some of them are truly developing from day number one. Those are very rare. Those are the rarest of the rare, and those are very, also very complicated cases. Um, next uh, slide, please. When we think of goals of cluster headache therapy, there is no cure for cluster headache. Um, just like with a lot of the primary headache disorders, these are chronic diseases, uh, there's no cure. But your goal is really, it's really threefold. The first thing you want to do is decrease the headache severity overall. Um, the second thing you want to do is shorten the headache cycle. So in the normal cycle of 6 to 12 weeks, you want to be aggressive and try to attack it early and try to break the, person out, the patient out of the cycle as short as possible so they're not suffering from this for long periods of time. And the third thing, the third goal that we look at with cluster headache therapy is prevention of attacks. And that's also what we, talk, what we call about long-term prophylaxis. And that's also extremely important, just like it is in migraine. Um, next slide, please. When we look at acute treatments for cluster headache, the hallmark of treatment is still 100% oxygen via face mask at a rate of at least 10 to 15 liters per minute. So when we think about, you know, when you see someone in the grocery store who has a nasal cannula with emphysema or chronic bronchitis, you know, they have a COPD, they're smokers, and they, they have only, they, those guys only get about two liters per minute of the oxygen, and they use a tank, and it's fed through a nasal cannula. When you're in the middle of a cluster headache episode, you do not use a nasal cannula. You put a full face mask, like what you get in a, a fire, when you're in the middle of the a fire station, that kind of thing. And you run it at a high rate, 10 to 15 liters per minute. It's very rapid. You want to get it in as fast as you can for about 10 minutes or even up to 15 minutes. And for many cluster headache sufferers, it's considered first-line therapy and really the safest form of therapy. Um, the second thing that we can use is acute use of triptans. And typically, you want a fast-acting triptan. You don't want an oral triptan, such as oral sumatriptan, which the brand name is Imitrax, you know, or oral Zomig, or, which is generic Zomatriptan. Um, those kinds of things, if you take in the oral form, and you think about it, it takes about 45 minutes or so to get therapeutic in the bloodstream. Well, if your headaches only last 30 to 45 minutes, it doesn't have any point in taking it. So when you take it, you want to use an injectable or a needleless injection of uh, sumatriptan or a nasal formulation like sumatriptan, which is Imitrex, or zolmatriptan nasal spray, which is zolmig nasal spray. So those are the fastest acting ones. The injectable triptans have an onset in as quick as 10 minutes, and the nasal ones are about 20 minutes or so. So if you're going to use those, it's really optimal not to use an oral triptan. Whereas, in, for, for instance, like in migraine, you can actually use an oral triptan because you have a little bit more time uh, to work with the headache. The third thing that some people describe are lidocaine or other local anesthetics. The problem with the local anesthetics are that they're very short acting. They don't have very long half-lives, and they're very, um, they don't really have any sustained effect for the patient. So they're not really commonly used. You can actually make a compounded form of lidocaine nasal spray. It does burn a lot, but you know, whether it works or not is still debatable. The fourth thing is injectable dihydroergotamine, or DHE45. It's something that we also use in unbreakable migraine episodes. And DHE45 has a very rapid onset of action. It just has a lot of side effects like nausea, um, flushing of the face, cramping of the legs. So there's a lot of things that can happen with it, but that's also an option. There is an, a nationwide shortage this year. As of the last two months, almost no place has DHE available in injectable form. The nasal spray form is called migranol nasal spray, and it's available in generic form as dihydroergotamine nasal spray. It's slower acting, but it also could be an alternative until the DHE injections are available again. Now, the last one that I put on there is called ergotamine tartrate. The old brand name used to be called Ergamar, sublingual 2-milligram tablets. And 
those cells, most patients say they really do not like. They're very, it's a very fast-acting ergotamine. Most of the time now it has to be compounded because I don't even think that there's a, a true manufacturer in the U.S. that's manufacturing this any further. It causes significant nausea. People generally don't like the feeling, and it's not really used anymore. And we tend to use oxygen and triptans or DHE commonly as first-line treatment. Um, next slide, please. Um, when we look at preventive treatments for cluster headache, um, as you can see on the list over here, it's very, very similar to what we got with migraine. So when we look at, um, you know, one of the things we look at in contrast to migraine, which uses beta blockers, um, you know, things like propranolol, metoprolol, atenolol, cluster headache sufferers don't really respond to beta blockers. They actually respond to calcium channel blockers, which is a different form of blood pressure lowering drug, and verapamil is the mainstay of treatment. So verapamil, um, we look at doses anywhere from 120 milligrams up to 720 milligrams. And there's a fairly large range on it. You know, we usually have to do an EKG on the patient to make sure they don't have any arrhythmias or any reason that they couldn't get the medication, any skipped heartbeats, things like that. Then, but uh, typically that's all that's going to be used first line. Its main side effect is constipation. It's the number one thing that people describe. So someone who's chronically constipated will probably not like high doses of verapamil. So we try to use it for as short a time as we can. Corticosteroids are the second things we use. And a lot of patients will require, for instance, higher doses of prednisone or dexamethasone or methylprednisolone. I mean, you may have to use it as long as a week or 10 days or sometimes even longer than that. And sometimes if you catch the, the cluster headache cycle early, uh, a lot of times you can get some break with the steroids. It doesn't always work. And sometimes when you wean off of them, the, pain, the headaches and the attacks can start coming back again. It's not a foolproof panel. It's, it's definitely part of the arsenal that we have for prevention. Lithium carbonate, which we all know is a medication that was used for bipolar disorder and still used to this day, but it also can be used in really difficult cases of cluster, patients that, don't, that are chronic or don't respond to conventional treatment. Um, lithium has a ton of side effects, including tremor, um, agitation, jitteriness. Um, it can uh, disrupt your thyroid hormones. So if you're on, for instance, um, Synthroid or one of the thyroid replacement drugs, sometimes you need higher doses of it when you're on lithium. You have to check your thyroid levels. Um, Anti-seizure medications are also still part of the arsenal that we use in prevention. So Divalprolex, which is the generic for Depakote, or Topiramate, which is the generic for Topamax, those are still considered also used in the, as first line. You can use it with verapamil and with lithium. And some patients are on all three of them. Some patients take the three plus the steroids. Now, the anti-seizure meds, we all know, have tons of side effects, too, like tremors and um, nausea. Topamax can cause weight loss and appetite suppression. Depico can cause elevated liver enzymes. Um, so there's different things that have to be watched for with these medications, but there are some benefits if starting these early in the cycle. Uh, we also use relatively high doses of melatonin. I like to get patients up to 15 milligrams. So when you get melatonin to help kind of regulate some of the circadian rhythm and getting people back to sleep again. So, you know, normally you can buy five milligrams of melatonin um, at any drugstore, grocery store, over the counter, and any brand is fine, but you want to use probably like two to three of them during the cycle, especially if it's in this transition now into the fall months when there's less sunlight outside. You want to get your circadian rhythm as best you can because that also helps potentially to keep the patient asleep. Um, occipital nerve blocks have been discussed too in the literature. Um, I haven't seen really too much sustained relief with it. It's really Occipital nerve blocks I find better for occipital neuralgia and other really localized type of headache disorders where you can really locate and pinpoint the pain in the back of the neck, you know, near the occipital nerve region. Um, and, and really, you know, the, it's not a really sustained treatment, but some docs do use uh, occipital nerve blocks in combination with other medications. Um, next slide, please. The questions that we always get um, on patients with uh, chronic cluster, and this is more for the really complex cases that people have had chronic cluster for many years, they can't break out of their cycle, and they ask about what are the surgical options in these cases. And what we know about surgery, and surgery has been discussed for about 30 plus years in the medical literature. So, I mean, from rudimentary things to now newer stuff that we have on there. I'm just going to gloss over the next few slides. Some of the options are out there that they're really rarely considered due to the potential complications, because there's a lot of significant things that can happen when you're operating near the trigeminal nerve. And basically what you're seeing is that you can get sensory loss. So that's not a great thing if you're a young 35-year-old and you start losing your ability to have sensation in your extremities or your face or your lips. Um, jaw muscle weakness is another thing that we look at for potential complications of surgery. 
and the long-term benefits of surgery are very disputed. And a lot of patients have described the fact they might have had a surgery and their headaches still come back. So it's still, there are risky procedures with, you know, debatable outcomes on it. It should really only be considered after failed aggressive medication treatment or in patients who cannot tolerate medications. So those are really for patients that have done everything they possibly can, have tried multiple different things, and, or they have massive side effects to medications, they can't tolerate verapamil or the anti-seizure meds or the steroids or other multiple things that are out there that we use, lithium um, and other various drugs. So those are really the ones that it should be a last um, option, not an early option for patients. Uh, please, uh, next slide. Um, when we look at some of the surgical options, the surgical procedures that have been described in the past um, we talk about sphenopalatine ganglionect ganglionectomy. You know, when we think about the sphenopalatine blocks or SPG blocks that are done in migraine, they're very specific blocks and they're somewhat painful, but you could actually have a surgeon excise that ganglion um, that was done in the past. It's not really commonly done currently. The second thing is radiofrequency thermal coagulation. We do these radiofrequency things too for um, cervical uh, disorders of the neck too, where you can freeze or burn uh, the nerve itself. And those are also very limited in data. It's not really used routinely anymore. That's also considered an older uh, surgical option. Gamma knife treatment has also been discussed in the medical literature of the trigeminal nerve outlet, which may have a little bit more data, but once again, it's very um, conflicting too on there. So gamma knife is talked about a lot in neurosurgery. Um, whether it works in this case is still debatable, but it's a little bit less invasive than some of the other things. And then glycerol injection, the trigeminal cistern, that's where they actually go into the area, the area that houses the trigeminal nerve, and they inject glycerol directly. It has to be done by a neurosurgeon as well. And that's also very limited data and not really commonly used very much anymore. Um, next slide, please. When we look at research um, in cluster headache treatments, um, there's a lot of talk, as we all know in the literature, and you see on billboards all over the place about occipital nerve stimulation. Um, we look at that, they, it's occipital nerve stimulations where they place um, leads uh, by the supraorbital nerve, which is above the eyes, and then in the back of the neck, which is the occipital nerve, they use that for migraine. Well, if you do specifically occipital nerve stimulation and cluster headache, um, they're looking into this to seeing if that has a similar benefit to what you get in some of the really difficult migraine cases. And that's still ongoing research in there. We don't really know. It's not considered standard therapy, but it can be considered in patients that have failed multiple different options. The other things that people have described are deep brain stimulation. And you may have heard about deep brain or DBS. It's used commonly in um, really difficult Parkinson's disease patients um, where they put an electrode in the hypothalamus and it really uh, changes the excitability in the brain, and it's really, it's kind of a, an interesting procedure. It also hasn't really been proven in cluster. It's been very, very, very small clinical trials, but that is an option potentially in the future. Um, DVS is out there. It's been talked about. Sphenopalatine ganglion stimulation, or SPG stimulation, it's just like we talked about sphenopalatine ganglionectomy, where they actually excise the ganglion. Well, you can actually put a stimulator in that region, too, similar to what you do with occipital nerve. And there have been a few very small studies with less than 30 patients that have shown it possibly to be effective. And that may show some promise on there. It's not as invasive as a full surgery would be. It's something that potentially could provide benefits. Um, the transcutaneous vagus nerve stimulator, there was a very small sample size in cluster headache. And the vagus nerve stimulator is used in patients that have really um, complicated depression. You know, it came out about 12 or 13 years ago in the early 2000s um, for refractory or uncontrolled depression and people that didn't respond to antidepressants. And they used the vagus nerve stimulator because that's kind of the nerve that controls a lot of the urges of the body. And uh, basically, they, what they found is that it may have some benefit in a cluster headache. The trial for migraine really did not show any benefit for migraine sufferers, but there's a possibility, very, very limited studies on that. And that's also a little bit less invasive and some of the other procedures. The least invasive is transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS. And you may have seen the literature. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about this on the media. You know, the news uh, media has picked up on it in the print and on TV. And they talk about it primarily for migraine, where it kind of looks like a speed gun that the uh, troopers use, where they go and they just, you uh, use this stimulus and basically just press on it, and you press it against your head.
and it kind of uses acutely for treatment. It's kind of an interesting modulation thing for, for migraine. It hasn't really been studied in cluster very detail, but that's also a possibility of a less invasive. That's the least invasive of the options on there. Um, so it's kind of a, these are sort of the research horizons. The, in, the interesting thing with cluster is that because it's such a smaller sample size of the population, the research is just isn't as detailed as it is in migraine. When you look at percentage-wise, um, patients that have migraine are much more common and it's much more, um, you know, there's a lot more age distribution on it because you have people in their early uh, childhood going up into their geriatric years that can have migraine. And cluster is a little bit more centered around certain ages and it's just a much smaller sample size. So really any trial that they do is going to be very small and it really can't be um, truly given as a uh, you know, a real research paradigm for the general population, but it's just something to think about on there and some of the um, different research outlets on the horizon. And um, I'm going to kind of leave it open now to questions. Next slide, please. Um, there, I know it's uh, kind of a, a whirlwind tour of cluster headache. Um, as, you know, it's, it's interesting because there's not as much um, to talk about as there would be in migraine or chronic daily headache, but this is a very serious and complex disorder. And when patients have it, I mean, it's something they really, you know, when you look at it, it's a very small community, and they know a lot. They're very well researched on it. So I'm going to kind of leave it open to questions from any of the um, participants in the audience. You now we have about 25 minutes or so. Okay. Our first question comes from David. I am a 62-year-old. 62-year-old male suffering with back cluster headaches, always the right side. I recently had a Levio SPG performed by my interventional radiologist, and it seems to have helped a lot. Is this safe, and why, if any, are there any side effects? And the, which one was it? Which SPG did he have done? Which one was it? A Levio. Okay. Yeah, the... You know, some of these interventional procedures are being described. You know, when we talk about the sphenopalatine ganglion or, um, you know, the occipital nerve stimulation, deep brain stimulation, there are not as many potential side effects to those types of procedures. And, you know, if you had asked me several years ago, would I be open to some of these, I probably would have said no. But, you know, when you look at some of the other options aren't there, it really, um, you know, sometimes in a, in a very complex case of someone who hasn't responded to multiple different medications and is having their quality of life diminished because of these cycles of attacks, um, you know, I really am not against doing that kind of thing. It's just that there's not a lot of data. When we talk about the interventional radiologists, some of them are really good and they're very adept at doing these procedures. Uh, but it's, you know, it, it definitely is less serious of a risk than, uh, than something like a ganglionectomy where the neurosurgeon goes in and actually excises the ganglion, but it doesn't mean that they're perfectly safe. Um, but I think that you just have to weigh the risks and the benefits on there. In a severe enough case of cluster, I mean, sometimes you do have to think outside the box like that. Next question. Thanks. Our next question comes from Sandra. Can you speak to the difference between cluster and hypnic headache? Yes, hypnic headache. Cluster is a very kind of unique headache because it's, uh, it really, when it occurs in cycles like this, it can occur at really any time of the day. With hypnic headache, you typically have, these are mostly occurring in the nighttime, also similar to cluster, and they do have some autonomic symptoms. It tends to occur in older patients, too, over the age of 50 or 60, so it's not really a disease of younger patients. And it doesn't occur in cycles like this because hypnic headache can go on forever, basically. It's not... It tends to be a very unique type of headache. It doesn't have, you know, with cluster, you see the exact same population where basically you come in, you have tearing from the eye, nasal drainage from the one side where the eye is affected, you know, where the, where the headache is affected at, and it basically has a very distinct patch where it lasts for about 15 minutes to an hour. You know, there's a very specific frame on this. Hypnic headache I very rarely see in, in the literature, and I mean, I, even in, in a clinical practice, I may see one to two cases of hypnic headache a year. Um, it's really not that common in the population. Actually, even though cluster is not very common, it's very, very rare to see it. So in an elderly patient, sometimes I will use that in the differential on there because um, it is very distinct from a cluster. Um, next, next question. Thank you. Our next question um, comes from Shirley. 
have you seen in any patients where they could have possible migraine attacks in clusters? It is, yes. That's a good question about having um, coexisting migraine and cluster. I have seen it. It is rare, you know, because theoretically most patients with cluster do not have migraine, but I have seen in clinical practice there are patients that can distinctly describe where they have these cycles of cluster with the, you know, the eye symptoms, and they last very short, 15 minutes to an hour or two hours, and they're gone after six weeks, and then they don't get any headaches until they go through an actual real migraine attack with those longer duration, um, very distinct, and it can happen, even though the textbooks, it tells you that it's rare, but you do see that. There's no question. So I have several patients in my practice that you know, have both, and you know, I see them throughout the year for their migraine, and then we know that certain season times will bring on their cluster episode. Although what I've seen in clinical practice is that the patients that do have both tend to have less frequent cluster cycles. So instead of once or twice a year having a cycle, some they'll, they'll go several years between cycles, and then they'll have migraine for most of the other time. Next question, please. Thanks. We have a follow-up from Sandra. Uh, she asked if you know of any treatments for hypnic headache at the moment. Well, hypnic headache, what we do is we look at, um, you know, there's different types of anti-epileptic medications that we use to, it's, I mean, it's not, you know, I don't want to get too in-depth on hypnic headache just because this talk is on cluster, but there are some things, you know, Lamictal or Lamotrigine is one of the drugs that has been discussed in it, and uh, there's a few other, you know, there are some options in hypnic headache. It's just not a, uh, you know, when you look at the, um, it's not as clear cut as it is in episodic cluster headache or episodic migraine or chronic migraine. So in hypnic headache, a lot of times you also have to think outside the box because there's no definitive answer on it. So I don't want to get too detailed on it. I mean, it's something for people with hypnic headache, they should be seeing a neurologist or a headache specialist. Uh, we can talk about that another time. Okay, our uh, next, next question. Oh, next question comes from Margaret. Have you heard of the Reed migraine treatment of implanting electrodes for treatment of cluster headaches as well? Yes, we have. You know, Dr. Reed, Kenneth Reed. He's he's based in Dallas. So I I pass by his uh, his billboard every day on my way to work to Baylor every day, and I know I know him personally. But th it is you know the uh, the occipital stimulators, which I talked about in one of the sl the earlier slides on there are a very rarely, they're very, um, I mean, it's really mostly used for chronic migraine and occipital neuralgia, but there has been some limited data in its use in cluster headache. Um, it's just that it usually is the occipital stimulator, you know, which is the back of the head, the nerve in the back of the head, you know, and in migraine we use occipital and supraorbital nerve stimulation, which is above the eye, the supraorbital nerve, where, you know, in the, the read procedure he could do both, or he could do one of them. You know, the occipital stimulator, stimulator or neural stimulator itself. There's different companies that make these stimulators. There's Boston Scientific, and there's Medtronic. Um, there's also St. Jude's. There's a bunch of different uh, competitors out on this too. And there is going to be more data, hopefully, in cluster in the next few years. It's just very limited, and I can't really recommend it. It's not FDA approved specifically for cluster headache at this time, but it has been discussed in. As we know more, it may provide an option on there. And it is less invasive than a full neurosurgery would be. Next question. Our next question comes from Ronald. Are you familiar with any studies between cluster headache and testosterone defici deficiency? Cluster, yeah, there's been a lot of talk on it. It hasn't been proven, though. I, know I, I used to check all my cluster headache patients, particularly males, right at the start of their cycle on their testosterone. And, you know, a lot of, when you, if you just check the testosterone in the general population over the age of 40, the majority of them are going to have low testosterone. So I still, I'm not a believer in using high-dose testosterone in someone in the middle of a cycle because it has been talked about, it has not been proven at all, and there is, you know, I used to believe that that was the case, but then when I started testing testosterone in other patients, I realized a lot of them in any type of headache disorder have low testosterone. It's just very pervasive in the population, and there's no proof that replacing the testosterone has benefit in, in cluster cycles. Um, next, please. Our next question comes from Renee. Have you ever seen um, a cluster patient uh, drop out of cycles? Like, I guess she's asking, have you ever seen them dissipate and where to where they don't have cluster anymore? 
can they yeah, grow that's out a of good, it? That's, yeah, that's a very good question. Like growing out, and it is very true. We do see that. Although I have seen cluster patients as late as their 70s and 80s, but there is some truth to that, that uh, yeah, over time, the cycles do. So someone who, for instance, was in their 20s or 30s and had, you know, the cycles once a year or once every other year, as they get older, often it does start dwindling down, and they might have it once every five years. I've seen remission periods as long as seven or ten years, too, and there's some patients that really don't get them anymore after a certain amount of time. So it's not a guarantee that aging alone will completely get rid of the, the cycles, but, yes, the odds are in your favor. Just like menopause for women with migraine, the odds are in their favor that they won't have migraines after menopause when they're early 50s, but a lot of them still do have the headaches after menopause. A similar aspect is with cluster that age alone is not necessarily going to guarantee remission. Next question, please. Our next question comes from Jeff. Have you ever heard of cluster migraine, I mean cluster episodes getting progressively longer with each cycle? And should one be concerned as to um, why these are getting, or if these are getting out of control? Oh yeah, there is, there is some, I have seen that in clinical practice to patients who might have had, you know, when they first started getting them in their late 20s or even in college, you know, their late teens, early 20s, um, they get them shorter attacks, 15, 20, or 30 minutes, and as they get older, they may go up to an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, and I wouldn't necessarily say it's alarming. The time that it would be alarming would be if the distribution of the headache changed. So, for instance, your whole life you had the headache on the right side, and then one day, one cycle starts occurring on the left side, which, you know, like we talked about, cluster very rarely, if ever, crosses over from side to side. So that's the time that you would have to get an MRI and a more detailed neurological evaluation. So the duration of the headaches themselves are not as alarming as are the symptoms of the, of the attacks. So if something new pops up or something completely different from old cycles, so I'll usually scan patients always on a first headache uh, or first cluster cycle if we get to see them at that point. And then the other time I would do it is if they, you know, have this alteration or change, something significantly change in it. So the duration of the headache alone is not necessarily indicative of something bad, but the, it's the actual symptoms that accompany it are more concerning and the location of the headache. Next question. Our next question comes from Carl. Would taking magnesium help prevent my cluster headache, and if so, how many milligrams should I take daily? Magnesium? Magnesium, well, magnesium alone, you know, it's studied more in migraine, and we typically use at least 500 to 750 or even 1,000 milligrams of magnesium in a day for migraine. It hasn't really been studied as clearly for cluster. I'm not against using it in patients that don't tolerate prescription drugs well and want to try something else like magnesium, you know, 500 milligrams in the morning and 500 milligrams at dinner, that kind of thing, and then taking melatonin at night if they want a non non-prescription medication approach, but once again, there's not really a lot of data reinforcing that. It's not going to really harm anything other than it may, you know, bother your stomach. But other than that, you know, it's, um, it, there's not really, you know, if you go ahead with it, you're probably going to need to use at least 500 to 1,000 milligrams a day during the cycle. Next question. Okay. All right, it looks like this is our last question. It comes from Larry. My father was a cluster headache sufferer, and now I've started my cycle. He's 28 years old. Do you know if cluster headaches run in the family? Could they be hereditary? Yes, and I've written that, in one, or I put that in one of my slides under that there is, you know, it hasn't been proven the way that it has been in migraine. We've actually been able to localize, for instance, in patients that have hemiplegic migraine, which is stroke-like migraine. Patients are very, it's very localized to those regions, you know, we know exactly where it is. It's the CACNA12 uh, gene mutation. We don't see that in cluster per se. It hasn't been truly localized, but we do know there are families that do manifest this. So you could see it in a, a grandfather and the, the son and then the grandson. I mean, it could theoretically happen on there. And it would be nice if they could do, you know, I just think because of the rarity of the disorder, they, they really haven't studied it in detail. We haven't really been, you know, they haven't put in the time. It took them forever to be able to localize in migraine. I don't know how long it would take to do it in a cluster, but I, I do believe that there is some familial and genetic, genetic component to this disease. All right, Dr. Nissan, I'd like to thank you for um, having this conversation with us this evening. It looks like that was our last question.
and I'd like great. to thank everyone who joined us, and have a great evening. Thank you all for listening. Bye-bye.